Second video, and this time I'll be a little more ambitious with an actual short story on the shorter end. I've also spent a few hours figuring out the free version of iMovie, so now I can edit things. And since it's late October, I think a scary story is required by law, so let's start with the classic Edgar Allan Poe. Really, I should probably be wearing a costume and decorating the background with cobwebs and skeletons, but uh, I have some candles already, so that's just gonna have to do. Apologies in advance if this is just too spooky for any non-existent viewers. A lot of my fellow Americans don't like Poe. They think he's boring or dumb or pretentious, and they're right. Another poet, James Russell Lowell, called him three-fifths genius and two-fifths fudge, which sounds about right. He was an early 19th century American writer at a time when American writing hadn't really figured out its own groove yet. It was mostly imitating British literature badly. As a matter of fact, Poe was one of those who was starting to break out of that mold, but you can just tell there wasn't any Hemingway or E.B. White around back then to poke him in the ribs and say, hey, Edgar, it's okay. You don't need to use every 50 cent word in the dictionary. You don't need to try to sound clever. You don't have to overemphasize everything. So, for example, in my youth, I loved The Black Cat. I still think it's a wonderfully creepy story, but when I read it now, the fact that the cat slowly forms an image of a gallows in its fur, which is meant to be this big symbolism, well, if you actually try to visualize it, it's just so dumb and silly. It's like a My Little Pony cutie mark, and the hyperbolic way he describes it. It was now the representation of an object that I shudder to name, and for this, above all, I loathed and dreaded and would have got rid of the monster had I dared. It was now, I say, an image of a hideous, of a ghastly thing, of the gallows. Oh, mournful and terrible engine of horror and of crime, of agony and of death. Ugh. It's such a good thing that people learn to stop writing like that. So the best Poe, for my money, is where he puts aside all that junk and he just shares his sincere and deeply messed up self and leaves out the fudge. His poetry is good that way. Stuff like The Raven, Annabelle Lee, Alone, The Bells, The Conqueror Worm, all awesome, all very musical. And so I'd rank his best three stories as the shorter, simpler, poetic ones. The Cask of Amontillado, The Mask of the Red Death, and The Telltale Heart. Now all three are creepy, all three are wonderfully atmospheric, but of the three, the Cask of Amontillado is the most fun. Anyway, the big question is, pronounce it Amontillado or Amontillado? It's a Spanish wine, so it's probably supposed to be Amontillado, but this is set in Italy, where two L's just make a longer L sound. So I'm gonna go with Amontillado. <clears throat> the Cask of Amontillado by Edgar Allan Poe. A thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could, but when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You who know so well the nature of my soul will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length, I would be avenged. This was a point definitely settled, but the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt as such to him who has done the wrong. It must be understood that neither by word nor deed had I given Fortunato cause to doubt my goodwill. I continued, as was my wont, to smile in his face, and he did not perceive that my smile now was at the thought of his immolation. He had a weak point, this Fortunato, although in other regards he was a man to be respected and even feared. He prided himself on his connoisseurship in wine. Fortunato, in painting and gemmery, was a quack, but in the matter of old wines he was sincere. In this respect I did not differ from him materially. I was skillful in the Italian vintages myself and bought largely whenever I could. It was about dusk one evening during the supreme madness of the carnival season that I encountered my friend. He accosted me with excessive warmth, for he had been drinking much. The man wore motley. He had on a tight-fitting party-striped dress, and his head was surmounted by the conical cap and bells. I was so pleased to see him that I thought I should never have done wringing his hand. I said to him, My dear Fortunato, you are luckily met. How remarkably well you're looking today. 
that I have received a pipe of what passes for Amontillado, and I have my doubts. How, said he, Amontillado, a pipe, impossible, and in the middle of the carnival. I have my doubts, I replied, and I was silly enough to pay the full Amontillado price without consulting you in the matter. You were not to be found, and I was fearful of losing a bargain. Amontillado. I have my doubts. Amontillado. And I must satisfy them. Amontillado. As you are engaged, I am on my way to Lucchese. If anyone has a critical turn, it is he. He will tell me. Lucchese cannot tell Amontillado from Sherry. And yet some fools will have it that his taste is a match for your own. Come, let us go. Whither? To your vaults? My friend, no, I will not impose upon your good nature. I perceive you have an engagement. Lucchese, I have no engagement. Come. My friend, no. It is not the engagement, but the severe cold with which I perceive you are afflicted. The vaults are insufferably damp. They are encrusted with nitre. Let us go, nevertheless. The cold is merely nothing. Amontillado. You have been imposed upon. And as for Lucchese, <laughs> he cannot distinguish Sherry from Amontillado. Thus speaking, Fortunato possessed himself of my arm. Putting on a mask of black silk and drawing a roquelaire closely about my person, I suffered him to hurry me to my palazzo. There were no attendants at home. They had absconded to make merry in honor of the time. I had told them that I should not return until the morning, and had given them explicit orders not to stir from the house. These orders were sufficient, I well knew, to ensure their immediate disappearance, one and all, as soon as my back was turned. I took from their sconces two flambeaux, and giving one to Fortunato, bowed him through several suites of rooms to the archway that led into the vaults. I passed down a long and winding staircase, requesting him to be cautious as he followed. We came at length to the foot of the descent and stood together on the damp ground of the catacombs of the Montresors. The gait of my friend was unsteady, and the bells on his cap jingled as he strode. The pipe, said he. It is farther on, said I, but observe the white webwork which gleams from these cavern walls. He turned towards me and looked into my eyes with two filmy orbs that distilled the room of intoxication. Nitre, he asked at last. Nitre, I replied. How long have you had that cough? <coughs> My poor friend found it impossible to reply for many minutes. It's nothing, he said at last. Come, said I with decision, we will go back. Your health is precious. You are rich, respected, admired, beloved. You are happy, as I once was. You are a man to be missed. For me, it is no matter. We will go back. You will be ill, and I cannot be responsible. Besides, there is Lucchese. Enough, he said. The cough's a mere nothing. It will not kill me. I shall not die of a cough. True. True, I replied. And indeed, I had no intention of alarming you unnecessarily. But you should use all proper caution. A draft of this Medoc will defend us from the damps. Here I knocked the neck off a bottle, which I drew from a long row of its fellows that lay upon the mould. Drink, said I, presenting the wine. He raised it to his lips with a leer. He paused and nodded to me familiarly while his bells jingled. I drink, said he, to the buried that repose around us, and I to your long life. He again took my arm and we proceeded. These vaults, said he, are extensive. The Montresors, I replied, were a great and numerous family. I forget your arms. A huge human foot door in a field azure. The foot crushes a serpent rampant whose fangs are embedded in the heel. And the motto? Nemo me impune lecessit. Good, he said. The wine sparkled in his eyes and the bells jingled. My own fancy grew warm with the Medoc. We had passed through walls of piled bones with casks and puncheons intermingling into the inmost recesses of catacombs. I paused again, and this time I made bold to seize Fortunato by an arm above the elbow. The nitre, I said, see, it increases. 
It hangs like moss upon the vaults. We are below the river's bed. The drops of moisture trickle among the bones. Come, we will go back ere it is too late. Your cough, it's nothing, he said. Let us go on. But first, another draft of the Madoc. I broke and reached him a flagon of de Grave. He emptied it at a breath. His eyes flashed with a fierce light. He laughed and threw the bottle upwards with a gesticulation that I did not understand. I looked at him in surprise. He repeated the movement, a grotesque one. You do not comprehend, he said. Not I, I smiled. Then you are not of the Brotherhood. How? You are not of the Masons. Yes, yes, I said. Yes, yes. You! Impossible! A Mason! A Mason, I replied. A sign, he said, a sign! It is this, I answered, producing a trowel from beneath the folds of my roclair. You jest, he exclaimed, recoiling a few paces. But let us proceed to the Montelado. Be it so, I said, replacing the tool beneath the cloak and again offering him my arm. He leaned upon it heavily. We continued our route in search of the Amontillado. We passed through a range of low arches, descended, passed on, and descending again arrived at a deep crypt in which the foulness of the air caused our flambeau rather to glow than flame. At the most remote end of the crypt there appeared another, less spacious. Its walls had been lined with human remains, piled to the vault overhead in the fashion of the great catacombs of Paris. Three sides of this interior crypt were still ornamented in this manner. From the fourth side, the bones had been thrown down and lay promiscuously upon the earth, forming at one point a mound of some size. Within the wall thus exposed by the displacing of the bones, we perceived a still interior recess, in depth about four feet, in width three, in height six or seven. It seemed to have been constructed for no especial use within itself, but formed merely the interval between two of the colossal supports of the roof of the catacombs, and was backed by one of their circumscribing walls of solid granite. It was in vain that Fortunato, uplifting his dull torch, endeavored to pry into the depth of the recess. Its termination, the feeble light, did not enable us to see. Proceed, I said. Herein is the Amontillado. As for Lucchese, he's an ignoramus, interrupted my friend, as he stepped unsteadily forward while I followed immediately at his heels. In an instant he had reached the extremity of the niche, and finding his progress arrested by the rock, stood stupidly bewildered. A moment more and I had fettered him to the granite. In its surface were two iron staples, distant from each other about two feet horizontally. From one of these depended a short chain, from the other a padlock. Throwing the links about his waist, it was but the work of a few seconds to secure it. He was too much astounded to resist. Withdrawing the key, I stepped back from the recess. Pass your hand, I said, over the wall. You cannot help feeling the nitre. Indeed, it is very damp. Once more, let me implore you to return. No? Then I must positively leave you. But I must first render you all the little attentions in my power. The Amontillado, ejaculated my friend, not yet recovered from his astonishment. True, I said, the Amontillado. As I said these words, I busied myself among the pile of bones of which I have before spoken. Throwing them aside, I soon uncovered a quantity of building stone and mortar. With these materials and with the aid of my trowel, I began vigorously to wall up the entrance of the niche. I had scarcely laid the first tier of masonry when I discovered that the intoxication of Fortunato had in a great measure worn off. The earliest indication I had of this was a low moaning cry from the depth of the recess. It was not the cry of a drunken man. There was then a long and obstinate silence. I laid the second tier, and the third, and the fourth, and then I heard the furious vibrations of the chain. The noise lasted for several minutes, during which, that I might hearken to it with the more satisfaction, I ceased my labors and sat down upon the bones. When at last the clanking subsided, I resumed the trowel and finished without interruption the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh tier. The wall was nearly now upon a level with my breast. I again paused and, holding the flambeau over the mason work, threw a few feeble rays upon the figure within. 
A succession of loud and shrill screams bursting suddenly from the throat of the chained form seemed to thrust me violently back. For a brief moment I hesitated, I trembled. Unleashing my rapier, I began to grope with it about the recess. But the thought of a moment reassured me. I placed my hand on the solid fabric of the catacombs, felt satisfied. I reapproached the wall, I replied to the yells of him who clamored. I re-echoed, I aided, I surpassed them in volume and in strength. I did this, and the clamorer grew still. It was now midnight, and my task was drawing to a close. I had completed the eighth, the ninth, and the tenth tier. I had finished a portion of the last and the eleventh. There remained but a single stone to be fitted and plastered in. I struggled with its weight. I placed it partially in its destined position. But now there came from out the niche a low laugh that erected the hairs upon my head. It was succeeded by a sad voice, which I had difficulty recognizing as that of the noble Fortunato. The voice said, <laughs> A very good joke indeed. An excellent jest. Oh, we shall have many a rich laugh about it. At the palazzo. <laughs> Over our wine! <laughs> the Amontillado, I said. <laughs> yes, the Amontillado. But is it not getting late? Will they not be awaiting us at the Palazzo? The Lady Fortunato and the rest? Let us be gone! Yes, I said, let us be gone. For the love of God, Montresor! Yes! I said, for the love of God. But to these words, I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud, Fortunato. No answer. I called again, Fortunato. No answer still. I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth in reply only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick on account of the dampness of the catacombs. I hastened to make an end of my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. In pace requiescat! So, fun story, right? A reflection on the dark side of human nature, human weakness, human vulnerability. What's really creepy about this story is when you're going to sleep a few hours later and you imagine Fortunato's last hours choking on his cough and the torch fumes and the bad air, and through his mind is going through everything that had happened, how nobody had seen him with Montresor, Montresor had been wearing a mask, how no help would ever come, the joke with the trowel, the coat of arms, and the motto, all these chances for him to notice what was going on, but he was too drunk. I will not die of a cold. True, true. Drinking to his long life. In school, they call all that stuff foreshadowing, but that's beside the point. The point is how it's torturing Fortunato there in the dark, how he must want with all of his will to go back in time a few hours, but he knows that time will carry him into nothing but darkness and wet and damp forever. And that's why Edgar Allan Poe is a genuinely creepy writer. <laughs>